Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Greetings. Welcome to Swayam Prabha DTH 16 channel. My name is Ariba Shabbir and we have been discussing English language teaching. Today we will be covering a new topic and that is language acquisition and learning theories. Before we go and find ourselves into the theories, let us quickly recapitulate of what we did in the last session. In the last session, we discussed three important approaches that are useful when it comes to teaching language through literature. We studied personal response, moral philosophical response and also stylistic approach that are the preferred ways of teaching language through literature. We also understood that how English literature could be a great benefit to students when it comes to developing their language learning proficiency. Besides, we understood that teachers are conservative with regard to the uh, topics and uh, materials that they use in the literature class, but what is important is to incorporate those exercises and activities that encourage learners to speak more. And we learned that personal approach engages individual in literary text reading as personal fulfillment. Besides, we studied that stylistics is the study of varieties of language. It includes the particular choice made by the writer to illustrate his pitch. We also learned that moral philosophical approach helps students to be aware of values of moral and philosophical and identify them that lies in their reading. So, that is how these approaches are useful and they help the learners to understand and use the language in an efficient way. Now, uh, going on to the learning outcomes, after this session you will be able to understand the Pavlov's theory of classical conditioning, Skinner's behaviorist theory, Krashen's theory of second language acquisition and you will also get through the Chomsky's theory of universal grammar which is widely accepted throughout the world. So, let us first take the Pavlov's theory of classical conditioning because it is one of the earliest theories when it comes to teaching language and we will try to understand the entire scenario that was proposed by Pavlov through, a, uh, through an image. And as you see in this slide, there is an image. It illustrates the important concept that was introduced by Pavlov. And as you see in this image, there is a dog. You see that there is observation screen. Besides, you see that there is a tube for the collection of saliva and there is a container of meat powder. Besides, at the bottom, you see that there is a revolving drum for recording responses and you also find devices to count drops of saliva. So, how this experiment works? Uh, this is quite an interesting to know that on the first day, the bell rang. However, the dog did not notice the ringing of the bell. But after the bell rang, uh, the food was supplied to the dog and the experiment for the day was over. Second day, what happens is that the bell again rang and the dog did not notice the ringing of the bell. So, what happens is that after the ringing of the bell, the food was again supplied to the dog and the experiment for the day was over. The other day what happens is that the bell again rang, but at this time the dog somehow got conditioned that after the ringing of the bell, the food is generally supplied. So, as soon as the bell rang, the dog salivated. And the response of the salivation was recorded in the uh, device to count drops of the saliva. So, that is the crux of the Pavlov's theory of classical conditioning. Now, in order to understand this theory in depth, let us try to look about the important terms that are involved in the process. So, at first you see that there is a term called unconditioned stimulus. 
Now, what is unconditional uh, unconditioned stimulus? It refers to a new or something that was never experienced before. So, it will be something that is unlearned. When the bell rang, the dog did not know that the food is going to be supplied. So, this happened for the first initial days. So, it could be said that at that time it was an unconditioned stimulus. For instance, uh, the other examples that we can incorporate over here is that experiencing a really harsh winter for the first time that could be an unconditioned stimulus example. Trying out a new dish or hearing an unfamiliar sound for the first sound uh, for the first time. So, each of these stimuli can elicit a specific reason or response from the person. An unfamiliar taste or unfamiliar voice or unfamiliar behavior basically uh, is, is the example of the unconditioned uh, stimulus. And for Pavlov's dog experiment, I said the food in this context is the unconditioned stimulus. Now, uh, coming to up a new important term uh, point that is neutral stimulus. What is neutral stimulus? That does not elicit a response and that has nothing to do with something you experience for the first time or you may not be able to produce a reaction uh, from your side. For instance, an employee who is new at work may not be used to getting approval for everything. So, this way they simply reach out to the person they need something from. But if their manager encourages them to follow protocol, they will likely to be conditioned to go through the proper channels. So, that is something which is neutral stimulus is and neutral stimulus is uh, uh, you know turns into a conditioned stimulus. So, what is conditioned stimulus here is that it is the response that is associated with the stimulus. For instance, someone who lives in a really cold climate is conditioned to wear layers of winter clothes for, uh, for time. right? So, in this particular experiment, what we see that the dog is now conditioned uh, to see that after the ringing of the bell, uh, the, the food appears. So, here the food is now going to be the conditioned stimulus. Now, uh, when we talk about uh, conditioned stimulus, it means that the stimulus which was once unconditioned is now conditioned. So, it elicits a specific response from the person and in the Pavlov's classical conditioning theory, the metronome a dog hears for the first time is the neutral stimulus. After it elicits a response, it becomes a conditioned stimulus. So, the ringing of the bell or the metronome, I'm, uh, as I am mentioning in the slide, is uh, something which is first neutral stimulus and then uh, it converts into conditioned stimulus. So, each time a dog hears it, it becomes conditioned to salivate and it is a process of unlearning and learning by which we associate the stimulus with a feeling or an emotion. So, this then uh, produces a predictable response. Now, moving on to the um, fourth important term over here that is unconditioned response. So, unconditioned as you know, uh, uh, it, it, is, it is you experiencing a harsh winter for the first time and your response will be unconditioned. So, you will be chilly, you will be feeling shivering and most likely uncomfortable. Somehow, it tells that you are not comfortable with the stimulus or somehow you are not adapted to what is being uh, uh, given to you. And uh, this kind of unconditioned leads to another kind of response that is conditioned response and this conditioned response elicits uh, the fact that we are accustomed to a, a stimulus, we become habitual to it and you are likely to respond in a similar fashion. So, in schools for example, students are conditioned to have lunch or they are conditioned to have uh, uh, games in the in their in their uh, special class, or you can say that uh, 
in the experiment pavlov has tried to explain that the conditioned responses can be produced in the first interaction also so this is most common when the response is fear and for example if dog bites a child they may be conditioned to fear dogs so there are slight differences when it comes to categorization of these five terms unconditioned stimulus neutral uh, stimulus and conditioned stimulus and then we have unconditioned response and the conditioned response so now let us look up at this slide the three stages where we will try to understand the pavlov's experiment and at first there comes before conditioning at second there is during conditioning and then the third stage is after conditioning so what happens is before conditioning is that a natural response to something unfamiliar natural response to something unfamiliar okay so before conditioning uh, refers to an unlearned response uh, to an unconditioned stimulus it doesn't mean a new behavior has been adopted this is the first response produced by the unconditioned stimulus and uh, the neutral stimulus that does not elicit a response also falls under this stage only because in the classical conditioning theory it is said that there is no as such excitement when it comes to the ringing of the bell so at first there is nothing happening so it's a neutral one so before a neutral we are taking up into the first category and then there comes a next stage which is during conditioning what happens in during conditioning is the stage where conditioned stimulus elicits a conditioned response conditioned res, uh, el, uh, conditioned stimulus elicit conditioned response and the unconditioned stimulus has to be associated with the conditioned stimulus for this stage to be successful so this can take several repetitions or even single instance can also work if the product is so excited so th the pavlov theory is based on learned responses and uh, this entire theory tells us that how a learner becomes conditioned when they are supplied to some kind of uh, 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 some kind of outcome so this can take several repetitions like i said in the during uh, conditioning and this is the step in the process where unconditioned response to the stimuli get repeated and become learned response and the next stage is where a response to an unconditioned or conditioned stimulus become conditioned so repetition is the key in the second stage that is the during one and after conditioning tells us to the fact that when the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus have been identified they will elicit a conditioned response so i am writing over here conditioned uncon um, conditioned stimulus and unconditioned stimulus when they both are identified they will come out as a conditioned response and it is important to make a sharp differentiation between the condition and unconditioned response and the condition and unconditioned stimuli so here uh, both the stimulus uh, here both the stimuli are basically leading to the response and that's where we are coming up to the uh, end of this stage so after conditioning is the completion of the classical conditioning theory and it means the theory is effective and successful and your behavior in response to a conditioned stimulus is the same 
and uh, in order to help you understand this final stage uh, i can take up an example that if you are experienced vertigo in the past you will try your best to avoid places which uh, lo which are located at high heights uh, so with this we have understood the three stages of this pavlov's uh, classical conditioning theory now we will try to look up at the points that tells us that uh, what are the limitations when it come to the implications of these classical conditioning are these uh, uh, conditioning systems helpful in the learning system or they are not worthwhile enough so at first as it is mentioned in the slide it is written that classical conditioning does not account for the idea of free will it means that there is something which is being given to the learner and you keep on supplying uh, the product or uh, you keep on supplying the lesson to the learner continuously and in such a way this process happens that the learner becomes conditioned however the free will and the response that is required from the part of the learner is not really elaborated in this theory the second point as it is mentioned in the limitations is that this learning process underestimates how unique human beings really, really are so some may uh, elicit response in a positive way but some learners out of their uh, experiences would react or respond in a different way so like we cannot ignore the fact that each individual is different in nature now coming up to the third point it is mentioned there is no predictive quality to classical conditioning since it's running short of the you know empirical evidences so that's why there is uh, nothing like we can say that a dog or uh, if it is successful in dog we cannot say that a learner would you know uh, uh, would would uh, react or would respond to in in a certain way this is slightly unpredictable and um, it seems like uh, uh, we must should uh, remember the difference between creating and learning so here we are uh, creating the situation in which learners are tempted to learn uh, the language but there is a difference when it comes to learning because learners are not conditioned they are supposed to express themselves freely without any foundation and there are numerous uh, variables which can change the possible outcomes also so there are obviously variables and factors that are responsible for the growth and the development of the learners what a learner bringing uh, 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 along with himself uh, what kind of situation he is dwelled into it uh, what is he thinking at the point of time that all matters and what are the social and demographic features involved in it that also brings the results of the uh, outcomes so uh, you know variables may bring change in the possible outcomes uh, and the uh, other limitation that is mentioned over here is that it requires someone to have positive association to be useful in order to understand this line let us not forget that there are numerous changes that can occur in a stable environments which may impact how someone can react so individual experiences uh, you know perspectives and habits are just essential and of course if a person has set feelings about someone or something that is predominantly negative then classical conditioning will automatically not run so people do not develop positive feelings towards anything just like that they dislike intensely if you have uh, for example a damaged uh, mm, uh, taste for towards a specific food item then you would not like to visit that particular place again so that's how this uh, uh, how that's how the pavlov's classical conditioning theory fails to justify Uh, the numerous aspects that are involved with regard to their uh, with regard to the individual's variability and the situations and the circumstances that come across uh, the other point that is mentioned over here is that people can choose to act against their conditioning also so let us take the example from the experiment to address this advantage but then apply it to people an individual feels hunger pains in their stomach every time that they smell a uh, cooking in a cooking a pot you know in a slow cooker they begin to think of the potatoes or vegetables 
which only further the need to e uh, strengthen the need to eat something so a timer going off at this moment can create a trigger which ultimately stimulates a similar physical response when it occurs uh, every time the pot roast is cooking and then it provides a temporary effect when generating results so classical conditioning can create a positive response to different stimuli but pavlov here discovered that associating a bell or whistle with the presentation of food could cause a similar biological response once the connections were made but it would fade with constant use and if we kept ringing the bell several times without the food then the paired association that we have tried to maintain so far will be diminished or deteriorated and therefore uh, we can say that uh, though classical conditioning comes out with a lot of scope but it has certain limitations that cannot be ignored now let us take another perspective of the behaviorist theory it is b f skinner's operant conditioning it says that uh, the ideas uh, that follows up with actions are basically uh, re result in uh, reinforcing the language so there are two types of reinforcements that are mentioned over here positive reinforcement and the negative reinforcement and one of the examples is that, that children alter their use of language in response to this reinforcement so let us take this example in a more depth uh, what happens is if a child says mama papa dinner and uh, the response is positive so if the child is provided with the dinner following this uh, Uh, demand then the positive reinforcement takes place and the child is somehow conditioned that with the use of this language the dinner is supplied now what happens is if the child doesn't produce the right language and provided if the uh, response is not given or if, what if the child is ignored or what if the food is not supplied right after his uh, language use then the negative reinforcement would take place which means that the child would somehow think of reusing the language in order to correct himself and then uh, the positive reinforcement would grow so that's how this uh, skinner's theory is conditioning uh, uh, skinner's operant conditioning theory is designed and we will now look up at that how uh, the limitations of the behaviorist theory especially with regard to the uh, skinner's Uh, operant conditioning works is that uh, there is a developmental milestones the critical period of language acquisition varies and uh, the complicated nature of language matters so what is developmental mi milestones you know research has shown that children go through a series of milestones at uh, around the same age and this suggests that there may be more than just simple imitation and conditioning takes place so not just that you know child says and uh, the answer uh, is given in uh, uh, in in the form of the product but it needs to be understood that the imitation and conditioning that takes place may not usually be the same as far as the development of the child is concerned so there would be just more than something uh, than imitation and conditioning not constrained to conditioning and imitation and this suggests uh, that uh, uh, the operant conditioning is somehow restricting the restricting the child to use the language in a more creative way and this particular approach was highly criticized by professor norm chomsky and according to him the language acquisition device is the part of the brain that encodes the language not just the surrounding so just as uh, uh, certain parts of the brain encode sound now the second point as it is mentioned over here the critical period of language acquisition matters so at uh, at the age of 7 it is thought to be the end of the critical period for language acquisition if a child has not developed language by this point they will never be able to uh, have a fully grasp on it so this suggests that there might be something universal among human beings uh, that governs language development not the conditioning system that uh, uh, 
enforces the child to uh, uh, to to use the language in a certain way so this was the critical period that suggests that ev for everyone regardless of their first language background the child uses some kind of uh, universal algorithm to understand the language now the other point is the complicated nature of language it has also been argued that language and its development are simply too complicated to be taught uh, sufficiently through uh, reinforcement alone and children learn grammatical rules and patterns seemingly independently of positive or negative reinforcement for example if a child could call every four legged animal a dog if they learned the dog for dog before the names of other animals or they could say the words like goid instead of saying went you know there are so many combinations of words or grammatical structures and sentences that it seems impossible that this could all be a consequences of you know imitations and conditioning alone so this is actually called the poverty of stimulus which is discussed but here we need to understand that though classical conditioning and operant conditioning comes with a lot of uh, benefits and it tells that how a language and development takes place but it certainly tells us uh, a lot of limitations also when it comes to its applications so now let us go through uh, the stephen crashen's theory of language acquisition device this is really helpful when it comes to the acquisition and learning and stephen crashen is the one person who has distinguished the two important terms language and learning now look up at this slide language acquisition according to stephen crashen does not require extensive use of conscious grammatical rules and does not require tedious drill so it is in contrary to what we studied in the classical conditioning and in the operant conditioning and it says that language is not something which comes with a set of rules and it doesn't uh learned uh, uh, through tedious drills the acquisition requires meaningful interaction which means the context provides the learner the opportunity to develop uh, the language and also the natural communication in which speakers are connected not with the form of the utterances but with the messages they are conveying and understanding and he referred something called comprehensible input which is the crucial and necessary ingredient for the acquisition of language so like we see that many uh, of us uh, learn the language not in a way that we are taught with grammatical structures we were born we grew up and then eventually we learned the language it was not that we were taught with how to say a particular sentence it was all a uh, subconscious effort that resulted in our language development and L stephen crashen's clarity tells us that this is this comprehensible input is crucial and necessary when it comes to the acquisition of learning so the best uh, methods are there for those that supply comprehensible input it means the exposure the uh, the the environment in which the learner finds himself in a position to interact and uh, in low anxiety situations containing messages that students really want to hear so low anxiety situations means when we are consciously learning it and we have we are in a pressure to produce it at a certain uh, artificially created environment in that case it would be learning it would not be acquisition so uh, it would create a lot of pressure on us and uh, the comprehensible input is not the one which gives you a low uh, which gives you an anxiety uh, full situation rather it gives you a low anxiety situation and uh, these methods do not force early production in the second language but allow students to produce when they are ready recognizing that improvement comes from studying communicative and comprehensible input again there are two terms over here communicative and comprehensible input and not form forcing and correcting production in the real world conversations with sympathetic native speakers who are willing to help the acquire understand are very helpful 
now the message of the stephen krashen can be understood more deeply when we will try to distinguish the two important terms that is acquisition and learning and to clarify you the difference uh, let's say that acquisition of a language is a non conscious or subconscious process like i said when you grow up and uh, you are in the stage of development then you need not to go through the grammatical structures or you do not put conscious efforts to learn the language rather what you do is that you uh, eventually you know eventually learn it and that is what the acquisition happens. This acquisition mainly happens when you are learning the language without any effort which is not le really learning which is actually acquisition. So, here we need to understand that learning is different learning a language is usually a process of formal education. So, if a child for example, goes to school and he or she is exposed to A for apple, B for ball or C for cat and so on. So, child is actually performing a formal education in order to learn the language which is different from the native language which he or she has already learned. So, here the differentiation is something that is subconsciously learned and something that is consciously learned. So, educator uses a formal teaching methodology and gives the students instructions facilitating the understanding of the rules related to a particular language and when it comes to the teaching and learning process teachers focus on emphasizing the form of language rather than focusing on a particular text. Therefore, when it comes to learning the teacher can be seen busy explaining the grammar rules to students and adopting different methodologies in order to help students express their needs in the target language. So, uh, after understanding the sharp differentiation between these two terms let us now look up at the hypothesis which were proposed by Stephen Krashen and uh, you know these hypothesis brings uh, a new perspective when it comes to the application of uh, language learning pedagogy. So, at first there is language uh, so there is acquisition learning hypothesis this is states that there is a distinguish between language acquisition and learning like we just discussed. and learning. In language acquisition the students acquires a language unconsciously and this is similar to the example that when a child picks up their first language right and on the other hand language learning happens when there is conscious effort of discovering and exploring and learning the rules and the grammar of the particular uh, uh, language. Now, coming on to the monitor hypothesis. Uh, monitor hypothesis states that the learner is consciously learning the grammar rules and functions of a language rather than its meaning. So, this theory focuses more on the correctness of the language and to use the monitor hypothesis properly it stands on three important standards. And what are these? That the acquirer must know the language, know the language. The acquirer must concentrate on the exact form of language. And also the acquirer must set aside some time to review and apply the language rules. Right. So, uh, monitor hypothesis mainly focuses on the grammatical correctness. It does not incorporate the idea of including uh, meaning into your utterances and it mainly focuses on form. It asks you to know the language, to know the forms and accordingly frame your sentences. So, that is how the hypothesis uh, the monitor hypothesis stands. Now, coming on to the next point we have the input hypothesis. This input hypothesis places more emphasis on the acquisition of the second language. Uh, 
this theory is more concerned about how the language is acquired than th than it is learned so input hypothesis states that the learner naturally develops language as soon as the student receives interesting and fun information so it is not just that you put uh, you know conscious efforts to elicit it rather uh, a very uh, you know a very natural surrounding is provided to the learner and as a result the learner will automatically get the input and therefore the output would be produced so this hypothesis stands on this uh, uh, viewpoint now coming on to the new uh, the, the the other hypothesis the effective filter hypothesis now in the effective filter hypothesis stephen krashen says that language acquisition can be affected by emotional factors right and if the effective filter is high then the student is less likely to learn the language therefore the learning environment for the student must be positive and it should be stress free so that the student is open for the input so input is grasped efficiently only when the learner is stress free and if the uh, learner is surrounded by stress and anxiety it would be difficult for him or some kind of emotional stress and factors would influence his performance so that's how the effective filter hypothesis works and then uh, the uh, natural order hypothesis come into existence natural uh, order hypothesis says that uh, uh, the language learners should learn grammatical structures in a fixed and in a universal way so there is a sense of predictability to this kind of learning which is similar to how speakers learn their first uh, language so a sense of predict predictability is there which is almost uh, you know similar to uh, what a learner uh, learns in the language these hypotheses have their own evidences but uh, there are certain limitations also so the hypothesis have faced a lot of criticism and uh, one of the important uh, criticism that it faced was there was uh, there were lack of evidences in order to support these hypotheses you know we have got to know about the filter hypothesis the effective uh, hypothesis the monitor model and all uh, though they sound quite relatable but when it comes to extensive research uh, there is still a scope of knowing about it so now let us move to the noam chomsky's universal gra grammar theory it is widely famous and it came after the stephen krashen's uh, theory and uh, it has contradicted all the aspects that were given by the behaviorist approaches and you know it tells you a different perspective that how a language is learned and acquired and it is not that the formal grammatical structures are learned in a school or in an institution it is something that you automatically get it by automatic i mean that it is something which is universal uh, universally involved and what is it how it is incorporated and what does noam chomsky brings to uh, our classroom we will try to look up at through these lines that are mentioned in the uh, encyclopedia now the universal grammar theory suggests that every language has some laws okay and for example every language has a way to ask a question or state something that is remarkable so in addition every language has a way to identify gender or show something that has happened in the past or present if the basic grammar laws are the same for all languages a child needs only to follow the particular set of rules that is peers follow in order to understand and produce their native language in other words his environment determines which language he will use but he is born with the tools to learn any language effectively now notice the term over here he is born with the tools what does these 
tools refer to. Uh, Noam Chomsky argued the fact that uh, the human beings are brought up under normal conditions. They will always develop language with certain properties. And this theory proposes that there is innate biologically determined language faculty. I am writing over here biologically determined innate faculty right uh, that knows these rules that makes it possible for a child to learn to speak this faculty does not know the vocabulary of any particular language and there remain several parameters which can vary freely among languages. So, this universal grammar theory states that we have innate capacity to learn the language and especially when the child is born, he is already having that capacity to learn the language. It is just the matter that uh, which language he is So, this universal grammar theory states the fact that uh, uh, every language has some important laws, but a child is already born with the tool which is biologically determined and he or she has innate faculty which is responsible for the development of the child. And when the child uh, gets exposure to a particular language, uh, the child needs not to learn the grammatical structures of it, rather he or she eventually acquires it by just placing up in the uh, setup that is already there in his brain. Now, uh, Noam Chomsky also faced uh, um, uh, criticism with regard to universal grammar theory and few of the criticisms I am mentioning here in the slide, please go through. Universal grammar has no coherent formulation and is indeed unnecessary, which is uh, given by Wolfram Hinzen. Universal grammar is in conflict with biology, it cannot have evolved by standard accepted new Darwin evolutionary principles. Then there are no linguistic universals, universal grammar is refuted by abundant variation tall levels of linguistic organization which lies at the heart of human faculty of language. These criticisms of universal grammar are there. And like I mentioned that was given by Wolfram Hinson. But let me tell you that universal grammar's uh, theory is widely accepted across the globe. Now, let us consider the fact that uh, Chomsky does not say that language cannot be learned or cannot be acquired. He just says that we have the innate capacity to learn. It is just that we are supposed to get exposed to it and by the time we get exposed to it, we eventually develop it. So, it becomes easy for us to acquire the language, but when it comes to learning on contrary to that or when it comes to learning, a child needs to go through the formal education and this formal education will help him to develop the rules and learn those rules consciously uh, to get a command over it. So, that is how these uh, important uh, theories come to an end. Uh, there are varying uh, theories in the second language teaching pedagogy. We have taken up uh, two important approaches over here. One that the behaviorist view that we studied in the light of Pavlov's conditioning as well as behavior, uh, behaviorist approach of uh, B. F. Skinner in light of operant conditioning. And then we have understood the revolutionary idea which was proposed by Noam Chomsky under uh, the heading of universal grammar theory. So, now let us consider the points that are mentioned in the conclusion. At conclusion, I would say that uh, as far as the classical conditioning is concerned, many of our behaviors today are adapted through this theory of, uh, of learning by pairing of a stimuli, you know the condition and the unconditioned stimuli and so on. However, in human beings the conditioned stimulus is not only elicit a 
uh, re physical reflex such as salivation, eye blinking or fast heart beating etcetera, but it also can result in a fairly intense of emotion. So, though uh, classical conditioning comes up with uh, lots of limitations, but we see its practical implications in varying ways. And one of the examples like uh, it is mentioned in this slide is that it is not just whether we say uh, the matter of salivation like we saw in dogs or the kind of uh, you know eye blinking that we encounter especially you know when we see something which is coming strange to us or even at certain point we uh, eventually come up with the beating our heart faster. But we also respond to in a variety of ways and that results certainly in intensive emotion and uh, uh, positive and negative behavior and so on. So, going on to the next slide, uh, Skinner believed that human learning occurred by the same mechanism and that even very complex behaviors could be learned by reinforcing immediate behaviors because we saw that. Uh, positive reinforcement and negative reinforcement both help in a variety of ways. So, positive reinforces, reinforcement helps the child to, uh, to use the language and the negative one could help the child to, uh, to reorder the sentence or to correct the language and in this way the child is conditioned, right. So, both the operant as well as the classical conditioning come under the category of the behaviorist approaches, uh, behaviorist approach that were introduced to the language learning pedagogy at the earlier uh, phases. Now, we see that nowadays we look up at drill and practice and we include it in our uh, language learning classes and the earlier language teaching pedagogies had drills and a lot of practicing exercises that ask the students to convert from active to passive and direct to indirect sentences and there are drill and practice exercises existing today, but there comes with certain limitations also. Though the child becomes constrained to the conditioning systems, but there are certain limitations that cannot be ignored. But the fact to be noted over here as mentioned in this slide is that the drill and practice software is helpful for specific content if we use it in a computer technology such as multiplication tables or second language vocabulary. You know in these kind of scenarios, these uh, uh, conditioning systems would somehow help and that must be learned to a level of automaticity. So, if uh, it is brought to the learner, it would somehow contribute to the development of only certain kind of uh, uh, devices like vocabulary, like multiplication and can be used in a variety of mathematical and numerical uh, you know problems uh, to help them up. In second language learning pedagogy, games that are being uh, used and are prevalent in the market, they also follow the idea of the Skinner's operant conditioning. And in many of the management systems, we see a lot of examples that uh, gratifies uh, the idea of drill and practice and the operant conditioning by giving a reward and by not giving a reward. By giving a reward which means the learner is giving a positive reinforcement and by not giving a reward the learner goes up with no points. So, this kind of conditioning is existing throughout and game is one of the examples that we uh, are uh, considering over here as, a, uh, as, as an utmost uh, simplification of this theory. You know uh, acquiring resources and leveling up uh, this provide reinforcement while losing one sword in a battle or falling off a cliff serve to punish errors. So, you know in development of in the development of games uh, that mainly aim to help the learners uh, not to develop the second language learning uh, the second language, but also to enforces the learner to learn the uh, system or the values we see that positive and negative reinforcement provides extensive support to the responses. By positive reinforcement, I would mean that the learners, uh, you know, come up with a response of uh, medal or maybe one can see 
uh, sword for example as a, as a matter of proud and then you know when we keep continuing that particular game uh, and uh, th there is a mistake that happens or there is an error that comes across uh, that, that, that is encountered by the learner then there are certain negative reinforcements in the form of punishments which results in the conditioning system. So, next time when the child would be playing that game, uh, he or she would be very conscious of, uh, you know, of, of, the, of, of getting uh, the positive reinforcement and utilizing it in a positive way and may be restricting him or himself from getting the punishments. Now, uh, these, the these theories that are developed by behaviorists, uh, even though both classical and operant conditioning focus on the observable responses of the subjects that uh, produces a large impact in the language learning, there are many differences, in fact, between them based on the nature of the response, the role of the learners, the involved reinforcement and the nature of learning. So, these are the important uh, you know points that to be considered before implementing the conditioning system and uh, uh, defeating these two kind of conditioning there come a universal grammar and universal grammar says that uh, in modern linguistics is uh, there is the innate biological component of the language faculty this theory is usually credited to professor noam chomsky and the basic postulate of universal grammar is that there are innate constraints on what the grammar of a possible human language could be so when linguistic stimuli are received in the course of language acquisition Children then adopt specific syntactic rules that conform to uh, universal grammar. So, language is something which is already innate, especially when it comes to native language. It is just that the child uh, needs to get himself exposed to the language and the child uh, responds to the stimuli when he come across with it. So, uh, the child develops the language from his surroundings, from the context that is being given to him. It is not that he learns the grammatical structures consciously, it is the subconscious effort that takes place and that is what the universal grammar argues. Universal grammar takes up to the fact that there is an innate faculty in our brain cyst in our brain which helps us to grow and develop language. These are the references. So, with this we have come to an end of this session. Uh, we will take up needs analysis in the next one. I hope you enjoyed it. Looking forward to see you in the next session. Thank you very much. I am A. K. Sharma and I teach sociology at IIT Kanpur. I am going to address the question, what is the relevance of statistics in sociology? In India, there is some confusion about role of statistics in sociology and most of the students of sociology suffer from what I call phobia of statistics. But actually, if you look at history of sociology or the kind of works that are being done in sociology or which are published in prestigious academic journals, you find that there is lot of use of statistical methods and not simple methods, very advanced methods. All of you know as students of sociology, uh, you know that uh, one of the founding fathers of sociology, Comte, or another founding father, Emile Durkheim. 
Now, they said that sociology is one subject which differs from other subjects uh, in the questions that they try to answer, but they use the same method, the method of science. And that in sociology, uh, those who believe in this kind of approach, they are called positivists, Emile Durkheim called them positivists. Uh, they, uh, they believe that uh, social issues must be studied by using observations, experiments and other modes of collection of data. Now, statistics can help sociologists in three ways. Because if sociology is about social facts or patterns, not individuals, patterns, patterns of thinking, patterns of feeling, patterns of acting, behaving and they can be measured, they can be quantified and that explanation of one social fact can be given only in terms of other facts. We need statistics because statistics can measure these facts, statistics can describe these facts. So, one branch of statistics, we can call it descriptive statistics can help us in summarizing data, in measuring facts like you are all familiar with simple statistical things like mean, mode, median or methods of dispersion, standard deviation, range, variance, these are descriptive measures. They can also be used to measure skewness or symmetry or asymmetry in the data. Other types of statistical methods which are called inferential statistics are used to test hypotheses. We know that uh, any science including sociology if we follow that positivistic tradition is about testing hypotheses using scientific methods and for testing hypotheses like for comparative purposes comparing means of two samples or comparing variances of two samples or comparing correlation coefficients or regression coefficients, we need inferential statistics. And if you are familiar with some of them, t test, z test, chi square test, f test, these are the tests which come under inferential statistics. We use statistics for drawing inferences uh, about two or more samples. And thirdly, statistics can also be used for posing new questions. I remember that uh, a few months ago, I read an article in Population and Development Review in which uh, the authors uh, Cole and Gramajo, they tried to explain homicide rates and variations in homicide rates across uh, countries in the entire world. And they found based on statistical analysis, logistic regression and all, they found that one factor which explains variations in homicides rates in the world is female education, not culture, not governance so much, not even male education, but female education. Now, if facts are showing this, so you have a new sociological question why is it that rise in female education leads to higher homicide rates? And Cole and Gramajo then gave certain hypotheses, you may not agree with those hypotheses, uh, you may conduct this study on your own or test these hypotheses given by Cole and Gramajo using statistical methods. But the point I am making that in addition to describing data, drawing inferences, uh, statistical methods can also be used for raising new questions in sociology. And of course, you are all familiar that whenever the issue of prediction comes, predicting population of India, predicting urbanization, predicting uh, per capita income of India 20 years from now, 50 years from now, uh, they are also statistical methods are of great help. And finally, statistical methods have been used in monitoring and evaluation of development policies uh, run by various governments and NGOs.
थैंक यू वेरी मच